Hi. Hello. Welcome to Let's Learn About, the show we teach you things you didn't need to know. We're going to teach them to you anyway. Indeed we are. Yes. Um, yes. So I am covering a topic today that I'm honestly surprised I haven't covered yet in almost 100 episodes. Um, <laughs> and this time we're going further back in history than we've ever gone before um, yeah. we're going prehistoric uh, I'm going to be talking about dinosaurs uh, yes. how the earth was before we had continents yes and the mass extinction event that caused the dinosaurs to die out so when I told my sister yesterday um that I'd spent like over four hours researching mass extinction she was just like oh well that sounds jolly and I was like yeah but <laughs> the thing is it's a mass extinction that happened 66 million years ago so yeah. <laughs> it's it's mostly interesting to learn about rather than depressing um, definitely so yeah uh as with many of these episodes I find myself I told Ellie yesterday I find myself falling down many rabbit holes again um yes during my research so there probably will be a few small tangents but <laughs> I just a hope, couple <laughs> yeah but I hope you'll find it all interesting and learn some new things that you didn't know before indeed how have we not done dinosaurs before I now I don't know I love dinosaurs. I'm so excited for Christmas this year because my sister has bought me a dinosaur Christmas t-shirt. Ah, oh, that's so it's, cool. Uh, it's like covered in dinosaurs, like wearing Santa hats and like oh. with, with candy canes and stuff. And I'm, I'm so excited. But yeah, I'm, I'm so surprised I haven't covered dinosaurs yet. Like it's been on my list for... I don't even probably since the beginning of this podcast actually <laughs> yeah and I've never covered it and I don't know why Aww. so now, now is the finally the time I was gonna say the real question of this entire episode is yeah. what's your favorite dinosaur I don't know like the t-rex is cool but it's it's very cliche like it's mm. a very cliche favorite yeah um iguanodon is really cool it's just really small um and also there was this whole thing I can't remember if I've talked about it before on the podcast but when I went to uh Yalk a couple of years ago it's the young adult literature convention um me and a couple of my friends we did this workshop um with a few authors um it was the authors of Flawed so it was like Melinda oh, Salisbury cool. um Holly Bourne Sarah Bernard uh uh, Tanya Byrne who else wrote that book I can't remember but it's, it's a load of authors anyway did a workshop and it was like a writing workshop where we uh the authors kind of we would in, split into groups and each of the authors went round all the tables and they taught us about a specific thing so they had to pull a topic out of a hat and they had to sort of talk to each of the groups about that thing okay. and we had to develop a, develop our own story so it was about like characters world building things like that and we got Melinda Salisbury, who is a massive dinosaur nerd. Like, <laughs> if anyone loves dinosaurs, it's her. I feel oh. like I honestly have to, like, send her a message and be like, do you want to come on our podcast to talk about dinosaurs? Because <gasps> would she be absolutely cool. would, I feel like. Um, she's obsessed with them. She knows she's like a dinosaur encyclopedia. <laughs> um, but we basically rewrote Flawed. Like, we wrote, rewrote their book but with dinosaur main characters. That is <laughs> and, so cool. Uh, we called it Dino Flawed. <laughs> <laughs> oh um, my God. And the main character was an iguanodon called Weak Steve. Oh, Weak And Steve. Ev ever since then, I've just loved iguanodons, even though we had it as like, she was just like, oh, iguanodons are rubbish because they're really small and weak. Um, since <laughs> then, I've just Steve. kind of I've just kind of loved iguanodons. Like Aww. in in Animal Crossing, you can collect iguanodon fossils, and like I keep every like island that I have, I build an, a whole iguanodon fossil. I'm I just love them. So maybe that maybe that would be my favorite. That's pretty cool. Do you have a favorite? I do. <laughs> I like pterodactyls. Um, well, and because I have an ooh. interesting fact about pterodactyls actually in this ooh. episode. Um, and that's that they're not actually dinosaurs. Oh, for God's sake. All right. <laughs> In which case, then, my favorite actual dinosaur <laughs> is 
a triceratops because okay, I yeah. really like the cool. thing that comes out of the back of their head and don't yeah. tell me that it's not a dinosaur. No, that is. <laughs> no. No. Yeah. Um, no. Plus also in the movie Dinosaur, no, is it the movie Dinosaur? There's one of those dinosaur movies and I can't remember whether it's Dinosaur or whether it's the one with Happy Feet in it. Um, but there's this really cool character who is a, um, it's a triceratops. Yeah. And yeah. Nice. They've always been my favourite. I cool. love them. Well, I, I say a little bit about them in this episode too, so. Yeah. Right. So let's get into it. Um. So let's, I'll talk first. I've kind of got, as with some of my other episodes where it's quite long, this is like nine pages of notes, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's, I started out at seven and I was like, that's not too bad. Uh, and then I kept adding more and then it was eight and then added a bit more and it went on to nine. So <laughs> um, I've kind of split it into sections mm-hmm. just to make it easier. So the first one is all about dinosaurs and their discovery. Okay. Um, and they were actually discovered a lot later than I thought. Um, really yeah so dinosaurs arose during the middle to late triassic period um, of the mesozoic era so that's around 230 million years ago Mm -hmm. Um, and they are members of a subclass of reptiles called archosaurs um, which literally means ruling reptiles and uh, it's a group that also includes birds and crocodiles cool um so i mean you look at a crocodile and you kind of they look like they they are related to dinosaurs but birds are too Um, oh yeah my favorite fact is that chickens are like the closest closest relative of the dinosaur is the chicken yeah Yeah. uh yeah yeah. um and it's hilarious when we tell our customers that um at work yeah you you make you make dinosaur houses (laughs) <laughs> I, well yeah we tell them because people of course they think of their chickens as pets and then they're like why are they being so mean to each other they keep yeah. you know pecking at each other and drawing blood and we turn around and be like yeah because they're tiny dinosaurs <laughs> yeah they yeah and they and we our customers are shocked by this fact and yeah. it's like yeah yeah they're vicious little beasts uh-huh. yeah <laughs> don't mess with them no yeah so Scientists first began studying dinosaurs during the 1820s. Um, really? Yeah, when they discovered the bones of a large land reptile that they dubbed the Megalosaurus, which means big lizard, um, <laughs> <laughs> buried in the English countryside. Ooh. Um, so, yeah, in 1842, Uh, this is what I mean by it's a lot later than I thought it would be like the mid 1800s I just feel like they would have been discovered a lot sort of sooner than that um but but... then it was the Victorian era so everything went down in the Victorian era yes so it Um, does make sense but yeah yeah so in 18, 1842, Sir Richard Owen, uh, Britain, Britain's leading paleontologist, first coined the term dinosaur. He examined bones from three different creatures. Uh, the Megalosaurus, the Iguanodon, <laughs> yeah. um, which means iguana tooth, um, and the Hyliosaurus, uh, which means woodland lizard. Um, and they each had a few things in common and they all lived on land they were larger than any living reptile they walked with their legs directly beneath their bodies instead of out to the sides and they had three more vertebrae in their hips than any known reptiles so using this information Owen decided um, or he determined that the three formed a special group of reptiles which he named dinosauria um and the word comes from the ancient greek word dinos uh, meaning terrible and sauros meaning lizard or reptile so dinosaur <laughs> literally means terrible lizard yes <laughs> um so while on the subject of this i thought it was quite interesting first tangent of the day thought it was quite interesting to see some of the other common roots around dinosaur names Okay. And it can be funny translating them into English. Like it just it's safe to say they definitely sound better with their original Latin names. Yeah. Um, so some examples are uh, raptor um, mm-hmm. is the word for robber. Um, really? Which, yeah, which is very strange. Okay. Um, uh, stego, so stegosaurus uh, is roof. Um, so stegosaurus means roof lizard. 
um, which I guess when you look at it, it's kind of got loads of triangles on its back. Suppose, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Triceratops, you've got tri is three, obviously. And then uh, ops is face. Uh, So triceratops means three horned face. Which is perfectly (laughs) natural name. That's what it is. (laughs) <laughs> yeah um um tyranno uh, is tyrant yeah um, so tyrannosaurus means tyrant lizard um and <laughs> then pretty much what they are <laughs> yeah and then rex is king um so oh. i guess tyrannosaurus rex comes together to mean the king tyrant lizard <laughs> um, okay. yeah yeah, yeah. oh okay that's one of the few names where actually if you just named a dinosaur the tyrant king lizards. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty epic. Like, yeah. that's take that name. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, pretty cool. But I will say they definitely sound better with their, <laughs> their original Latin names. Yeah. Um, so since the 1800s, dinosaur fossils have been found all over the world and studied by paleontologists. I think they've been found now on every single continent. Yeah. Um and yeah paleontologists have been studying them to find out about the many different types of them um, that existed they scientists have traditionally divided dinosaur groups into two sort of types um you've got ornithischia uh, or bird hipped or mm-hmm. uh saurischia which is lizard hipped um so from there dinosaurs have been broken down into numerous genera so um for example, like uh, Tyrannosaurus or Triceratops, and then you've got like different types of those things, um, and then each genus into one or more species. Some dinosaurs uh, were bipedal, which means they walked on two legs. Um, Some were quadrupedal, which means they walked on four legs. Um, And then some were able to switch between the two. Um, Some dinosaurs were covered with a type of body armour, while some probably had feathers like their modern bird relatives. Uh, some moved quickly while other, others moved really sort of lumbering and slow. Um, most dinosaurs were herbivores or plant eaters, um, but some were carnivorous um, and hunted or scavenged other dinosaurs in order to survive. Um, so I, find, I, there were so many cool facts about them um, that I was like, I didn't know how to really structure how to do it. So I thought rather than bombard you with like in-depth knowledge, I would just pick out a few of the best facts um, and just sort of bullet point them. So um, some of these things I'll come back to a bit later on. Mm -hmm. Um, So the first one is that modern humans have only existed for a few hundred thousand years and human civilization only got started around 10,000 years ago, which is sounds like a long time to say only but it's like the blink of an eye on like a jurassic time scale so in comparison to our lifespan dinosaurs roamed the earth for 165 million years uh meaning that they have been the most successful vertebrate animals ever to colonize earth (laughs) which just makes it even more sad that they were wiped out but yeah um So just to further demonstrate how long dinosaurs existed, the age of the dinosaurs, um, so the Mesozoic era, was split into three periods. So you've Mm -hmm. got the Triassic period, which was 237 to 201 million years ago. Uh, The Jurassic period, which was 201 to 145 million years ago. Uh, And the Cretaceous period, which was 145 to 66 million years ago. Um, These periods saw... The development of the dinosaurs, um, like the evolution of them, um, marine reptiles, fish, mammals, flying animals, um, including pterosaurs and birds, and a huge range of plant life. Um, The largest dinosaurs didn't emerge until the Cretaceous period, so the very last period of the era, um, which started over 100 million years after the start of the age of Mm -hmm. the dinosaurs. So kind of related to that contrary to what most people think and what films often show where loads Mm -hmm. of species of dinosaurs seem to coexist 
not all dinosaurs lived during the same geological period. So no. the Stegosaurus, for example, lived during the late Jurassic period, about 150 million years ago, whereas the T-Rex lived during the late Cretaceous period, about 72 million years ago. So that means that the Stegosaurus were extinct for 66 million years before the Tyrannosaurus even walked on Earth, which is just mind-blowing. <laughs> yeah. And how many dinosaur movies do we see where the T-Rex ends up eating a dinosaur that in yeah. actuality wouldn't have lived even yeah. in close proximation to each other in like, terms of timelines? It could have been extinct for millions of years. Yeah. Which just blows my mind. Like, that's just You'd crazy. also think people would do the research before they make yeah. dinosaur movies. It's yeah. sort of like, okay, before we have this animal eat this animal, would that have actually happened? Yeah. Or are we picking two two animals from two very vastly different time periods yeah. and shoving them in the same movie? Just a yeah. thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's a common idea that dinosaurs were really dumb. Um, and while it's true that some plant-eating dinosaurs like the Stegosaurus had such tiny brains compared to the rest of their bodies, uh, meat-eating dinosaurs, including the T-Rex, possess slightly more brain power. They often require better than average sight, smell, agility and coordination to reliably hunt down prey. They still weren't geniuses, though. Um, even the smartest dinosaurs were only on an intellectual par with modern ostriches. <laughs> so, yeah, ostriches are vicious, so I wouldn't yeah. mess with them either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I was just thinking, <laughs> I'm sure we've mentioned ostriches before and realised that it was one of our very first episodes ever was the ostrich war of Australia. Emu, emu, emu that was it, emu, damn it. The great emu war. Emu war. Of 1832, I think it was. It was like episode three. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, some things that you class as dinosaurs might not actually be dinosaurs. Mm. Um, so the word dinosaur applies only to land-dwelling reptiles. Ah. Oh. Um, possessing a specific hip and leg structure. Okay. Um, among other sort of anatomical characteristics. Mm -hmm. As large and impressive as some general were flying pterosaurs and swimming plesiosaurs weren't dinosaurs at all and some of them weren't even all that closely related to dinosaurs um, <laughs> except for the fact that they were also classified as reptiles um so yeah i've always just assumed that like um they're all they're just all dinosaurs, all just different yeah. types of dinosaurs. They were but, all in the dinosaur books together. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but they're just they're just a type of flying reptile. <laughs> Which is just I, weird. I still like pterodactyls. I yes. don't care what anyone they're, says. Yes, <laughs> they're very cool. Um, I always think of Torchwood, where they've got a pterodactyl flying around their, <laughs> yeah. their hub. Um, and the uh, Demetrodon, which is often described as a dinosaur, um, was actually an entirely different kind of reptile that flourished tens of millions of years before the first dinosaurs evolved. Okay. It's very cool. Yeah. Um, so we come on to the next section. Um, so at the time the dinosaurs arose during the Triassic era, um, all of the Earth's continents were connected together in one landmass uh, now known as Pangaea. Um, so, yeah, I've, I'm going to talk a little bit about Pangaea. Um, to start with, I literally had, this is why this kind of kept expanding, because to start with, I literally had one tiny paragraph that just said that they existed on Pangaea, and then I moved on. I then realised, oh, I want to learn about that too. So I got, yeah. like, I added, like, an entire section about it. <laughs> <laughs> so Pangaea. Um, was surrounded by one enormous global ocean uh, called Panthalassa. Um, there were no polar ice caps and oh. the climate at the equator was hot and dry um, and there were violent monsoons. Uh, some estimates put the average air temper temperature across most of the continent at well above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, so 38 Whoa. Celsius. Um, and conditions were wetter in the north, um, the part of Pangaea that corresponds to modern day Eurasia and mm -hmm. the south, so Australia and Antarctica. But there were no frozen areas, like there were no ice caps. Interesting. Um, 
So Pangaea's existence was first proposed in 1912 by a German meteorologist called Alfred Wegener uh, as part of his theory of continental drift. Um, okay. Its name is derived from uh, the Greek uh, Pangaea or Pangaea, uh, meaning mm-hmm. all of Earth or all the yeah. Earth. So Pangaea's uh, conceptualization began with Wegener's work in, in 1910, he became impressed with the similarity in coastlines of Eastern South America and Western Africa and speculated that those lands had once been joined together. Uh, he began to toy with the idea that in uh, the late uh, Paleozoic era, which ended uh, about 252 million years ago, um, that all the present day continents had formed a single landmass uh, mm-hmm. or, or supercontinent, which subsequently broke apart. So other scientists had proposed that such a continent existed, but they had explained the sep- separation of the modern world's continents as resulting from the subsidence or the sinking of large portions of the supercontinent to form right. the oceans. Um but Wegener instead proposed that portions of Pangaea had slowly moved thousands of miles apart over long periods of time. So rather yeah. than portions of the land sinking, it had just actually broken apart. Yeah. Um, so for this movement, he proposed the term continental displacement, which then gave rise to the term continental drift in 1912. Yeah. Uh, the breakup of Pangaea is now explained in terms of plate tectonics rather than Wegener's concept of continental drift. Um, Mm. Very loud traffic outside, (laughs) thank you. Um, uh, So his theory basically just just stated that Earth's continents were once joined together and lasted like this for most of geologic time. Mm -hmm. Um, The idea of plate tectonics is one of those things that is so scientific that I was like even trying to find simple explanations and I was just like, some of this goes way over my head. But um, it basically says that Earth's outer shell or lithosphere consists of large rigid plates that move apart um, at oceanic ridges and then either come together or slip past one another. Mm-hmm. Very basic explanation. Yeah. Um, so I always say it's... Um because I learned this while I was in New Zealand, because yeah. of course tectonic plates is what causes a lot yeah. of, you know, earthquakes and yeah. stuff like that. And the way they always explained it to me was like, it's if you take a eggshell, mm. like, like a boiled egg yeah. and you crack it and it splits into all those component parts. Yeah. Um, that is the tectonic plates. And like, right. if you slide them, they'll either crack more and basically yeah. do this, which is how mountains and mountain ranges are formed. Yeah. Or they do this and they slide underneath one another or right. they just start rubbing up against each other yeah. which is how you get earthquakes okay yeah because yeah. it's the tectonic plates banging and rubbing up against each other and yeah. it makes the world shake basically or that yeah. portion shake um and that's what happens in right. new yeah. zealand um cool. on a fairly regular basis yeah. <laughs> crazy mm. um so The pattern of seafloor spreading indicates that Pangaea didn't break apart all at once, but rather fragmented in distinct stages. Mm -hmm. Um, So the first oceans formed from the breakup uh, around 180 million years ago um, were the central Atlantic Ocean between northwestern Africa and North America and Mm -hmm. the southwestern Indian Ocean between Africa and Antarctica. Um, The South Atlantic Ocean opened about 140 million years ago as Africa separated from South America. And uh, around the same time, um, India separated from Antarctica and Australia, uh, forming the Central Indian Ocean. Um, And then finally, about 80 million years ago, so we're talking 100 million years after the first (laughs) separation, um, North America separated from Europe and Australia began to drift away from Antarctica and India broke away from Madagascar. Um, So India eventually collided with Eurasia um, approximately 50 million years ago, forming the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, some of the earliest dinosaurs existed on Pangaea. So that's, that kind of easily explains why they've been like fossils have been found 
on every single continent in the world because they yeah. they survived when the, the earth was just one giant continent they they literally just ruled over one giant continent <laughs> um so yeah dinosaurs probably saw a heck of a lot of change over their 150 million year lifespan um but unfortunately and this brings me on to the next section the biggest change in their lifespan would be the start of the mass extinction event that would wipe them all out um so dinosaurs mysteriously disappeared at the end of the cretaceous period around 65 66 million years ago okay many other types of animals as well as many species of plants died out around the same time as the dinosaurs and numerous competing theories exist even today as to what caused this mass extinction okay so the event was called the cretaceous tertiary extinction or the kt event for short um or it's also called the KPG extinction or the Cretaceous Paleogene uh, extinction, uh, Paleogene extinction, sorry. Uh, This global extinction event was responsible for eliminating approximately 80% of all species of animals um, at or very close to the boundary boundary between the Cretaceous and and Paleogene periods around 66 million years ago. So the name KT, because I was like, well, if it's Cretaceous, why is it K? That doesn't make any sense. That starts with a C. Um, But the K comes, apparently comes from uh, the German word Kaida, meaning chalk, which references the chalky sediment of the Cretaceous period. Oh, okay. That makes more sense. Yeah. Um, yeah because i was i've always sort of seen kt but why is it k when it's cretaceous like yeah you um, still sit there and go was cretaceous always spelt with a k and we yeah. didn't realize but or no it's think, apparently okay. because of yeah germany of <laughs> yeah yeah um which i guess possibly makes sense because of uh wegener also talking about maybe he, because True. he's german maybe i don't know but um yeah and the word tertiary Uh, was traditionally used to describe that period um so again i have another small tangent that i wasn't expecting (laughs) this was one of my rabbit holes Um, considering how much we all hear or learn about this mass extinction Mm -hmm. you may be surprised to learn that the kt extinction ranks only third in severity of the five major extinction episodes that happened during earth's lifespan Um, okay so in as i said in typical let's learn about fashion it's time for a quick yeah. tangent about yeah. these these five major extinction events so okay. in an episode a while ago we talked about how incredible the earth is and just how lucky mm-hmm. we are to be here and how yeah. like the amount of stuff that has happened on earth just makes it even more incredible that we're still here and thriving um very much so so these extinction events prove that even further the earth has been through the ringer so each of these events varied in size and cause, but all of them mm-hmm. completely devastated the biodiversity found on Earth every time. Oh, so a mass extinction can be defined as a time period in which a large percentage of all known living species go extinct. Mm-hmm. Um, there are several causes for mass extinctions, such as climate change, um, geological catastrophes. Um, so, for example, numerous volcanic eruptions all happening at once um, or meteor strikes onto the Earth's surface. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that is kind of scary is that there's studies being done currently into whether we're right now living through the sixth mass extinction, <laughs> which is kind of scary because when I read climate change as a big reason for mass extinction i was just like sounds familiar Mm. um kind of scary thinking about the fact that because these mass extinctions can happen over millions of years and yeah it's kind of scary thinking that we could potentially be living through the sixth mass extinction event um yeah which is very scary um very scary pausing for a siren (laughs) Yeah, but that's why you got to listen to people who are trying to do something about it. Yeah, I know. And it's it's crazy that most of the cause is like humans. Oh, it's our own stupid fault. Definitely. We're destroying our own planet. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Like idiots. Um, yeah. So, um, a quick note that I found interesting was how these mass extinction events can actually aid evolution. 
Um, so since so many species die off during these catastrophic events, mm. there as a result, there's much more room for the surviving species to spread out. There's less competition for food and resources, um, shelter and even mates, allowing leftover species from mass extinction events to thrive and reproduce rapidly. So as populations separate and move away over time, they adapt to new environmental conditions and they eventually reproduce uh, kind of isolated from their original populations. And at that point, they can be considered a brand new species. So as new species continually evolve and adapt to their ever-changing environments, the stronger the new ecosystem can start to become again. Um, And there's studies that show that it can take millions of years. Like it can take millions of years for for biodiversity to sort of um, react to to the changes and sort of become strong again. But even so it's kind of interesting that even though there's a big sort of catastrophic mass extinction, it can be good news for evolution. Exactly. Um, So yeah, always see the positives. (laughs) Always. Um, So the first known major mass extinction event uh, that occurred um, was during the, I, right. There's also, by the way, going to be a lot of words that, (laughs) that I'm gonna (laughs) struggle to pronounce um in true learn about pod fashion (laughs) bear with me as I try and remember how to pronounce them um so this one is the Ordovician I think period um of the Paleozoic era um and this happened around 440 million years ago um so at this time in the history of earth life Mm -hmm. was in its very early stages the first known life forms appeared around 3.6 billion years ago but by the ordovician period period larger aquatic life forms had come into existence Mm -hmm. um it's thought that there were even some land species at this time oh wow Um, the cause of this mass extinction is thought to be the shift in the continents um and the drastic climate change that followed. Okay. Um, because as we said, Pangaea was sort of very, the climate was very hot and wet. Mm. But as the continent started to drift, they each started to sort of develop their own climates. Yeah. Um, so this this t- period of climate change was kind of catastrophic to some of the mm. life. Um, So it happened in two waves. The first wave was an ice age that encompassed the entire earth. Um, And I'm just thinking about the film, like instantly I just think of Scrat and his acorn. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, Sea levels lowered and many land species couldn't adapt fast enough to survive the harsh cold um, climates. Mm. So the second wave was when the ice age finally ended, and it wasn't good news. Um, the episode ended so suddenly that ocean levels rose too quickly to hold enough oxygen to maintain the species that survived the first wave. Okay. And again, species were too slow to adapt before extinction took them out completely. Um, it was then up to the few remaining uh, aquatic. Uh, autotrophs I'll come back to that word in a sec um, to increase the oxygen levels so that new species could evolve Um, so autotrophs are organisms that can produce their own food using light water um, carbon dioxide and other chemicals so Mm -hmm. um, kelp is a modern example of an autotroph okay Um, but they've been so important to the continuation of earth basically yeah. because they're like in the food chain they're like the producers at the bottom like they can yeah. produce they can like produce their own food basically mm-hmm. um so the second major mass extinction happened during the devonian period of the paleozoic era um around 375 million years ago um this actually followed the previous one relatively quickly Oh, wow. Just as climate, the climate uh, stabilised and species adapted to new environments and life on Earth began to flourish again, almost 80% of all living species, both in water and on land, were wiped out again. Oh my God! So there are several hypotheses as to why this occurred. The first hmm. wave, which dealt a major blow to aquatic life in particular, may have actually been caused by the quick colonisation of land. Uh, So many aquatic plants adapted to live on land, leaving fewer autotrophs to create oxygen for all of the sea life. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and this led to mass death in the oceans. Oh my um, the plants quickly moved. Uh, the, the, the plants quick move to land also had a major effect on the carbon dioxide available in the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Um, so by removing so much of the greenhouse gas so quickly, temperatures plummeted. Uh, land species had trouble adapting to these changes in climate and went extinct as a result. Oh my God. And then the second wave of this extinction is more of a mystery. Um, it could have included mass volcanic eruptions and oh some God. meteor strikes, but the exact cause is still considered unknown. They knew mm. there was potentially a second wave. Yeah. But we don't really know what caused it. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, the third um, was... Uh, during the last period of the Paleozoic era, called the Permian period, around 250 million years ago, this is the largest of all known mass extinctions, with uh, 96% of all species on Earth being completely lost. Oh my god! And because of that, this event has been titled the Great Under, uh, the Great Dying, not Undying. That would be different. The Great That's Dying, a whole different thing. <laughs> the Great Dying. Um, so aquatic and terrestrial life forms perished relatively quickly as this event took place. It's still a huge mystery what set this this event off. And several hypotheses have been thrown around by scientists. Some believe that they may there may have been a big chain of events that led to species disappearing. Um, again, this could have been mass volcanic activity um, paired with asteroid impacts that sent deadly methane and basalt into the air mm. and across the surface of the Earth. Um, these could have caused a decrease in oxygen that suffocated life um, and brought about quick climate change. Um, newer research points to a particular microbe that flourishes when methane is high. Okay. And these microbes may have taken over and choked out life in the oceans as well. Um, yeah. If anyone listening by any chance has read Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir, this may sound familiar to you. No spoilers if anyone wants to read the book, but that's <laughs> kind of what happened in that book. Is uh, It's the first thing I thought of when I researched this was, in that book, it's specifically about Earth being swallowed by a particular microbe, wow. which I thought was very interesting. Andy Weir yeah. is always so scientifically accurate, and seeing this made me realise just how accurate it is. Um, but yeah, whatever the cause, this biggest of the major mass extinctions brought an end to the Paleozoic era, and a whole new era began, which was the Mesozoic era, um, mm. which was the, basically the age of the dinosaurs. So this is this is what I mean, where even though it seems so catastrophic and it wipes out so much of life, like it can aid extinct uh, aid extinction, it can aid, aid evolution in yes. such a big way that this yeah. massive, like the biggest extinction event opened up the earth to be able to evolve dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. It's just mad. Um, so the fourth major mass extinction was actually a combination of many smaller extinction events that happened over the last 18 million years of the triassic period um around 200 million years ago yeah um over this really long time span about half of all known species on earth at the time perished um the causes of these individual small extinctions can for the most part be attributed to volcanic activity again with the basalt flooding um, the gases spewed into the atmosphere from vol- volcanoes also created climate change issues that changed sea levels and possibly even pH levels in the oceans changed. Mm. Um, and then finally, we come back to the KT mass extinction, which is perhaps the most well-known. Um, yeah. And uh, despite it not being the biggest, it's arguably the most recent. Um, even though it was 66 million years ago, it's kind of, I say arguably the most recent because of this yeah. idea that we could potentially be in one right now. Um, so uh, this extinction happened, as I said, 65 or 66 million years ago, and it became the dividing line between the final period of the Mesozoic era, the Cretaceous period, and yeah. the tertiary period of uh, the Cenozoic era. Um, so up to 75% of all known living species died during this event including the dinosaurs oh god um 
and that brings us back nicely to this episode <laughs> so that was a very big tangent i just really wanted to cover those extinction events because i didn't even realize that there had been so many and yeah no, it just... you only ever hear about the one yeah and it's because it was it feels like the most drastic because it killed the dinosaurs yeah. whereas before it was all kind of like small plant life and maybe like microbial life yeah um, so i think the kt extinction was the, the one that killed like the really big species like it was the first one that killed like such a big species um so yeah coming back to now more about the kt extinction so for many years paleontologists believed that the kt extinction event was caused by climate and geological changes that interrupted the dinosaurs food supply so one early theory was that small mammals ate dinosaur eggs uh, reducing the dinosaur population until it become became unsustainable um, another theory was that dinosaurs bodies became too big to be operated by their tiny brains um, and some scientists believe that a great plague decimated the dinosaur population um, and then spread to the animals that feasted on their carcasses Mm. Um, starvation was also another possibility large dinosaurs required vast amount of food and could have stripped bare all the vegetation in their habitat um, but many of these theories are easily dismissed um, this feels like my last episode <laughs> where I did <laughs> the Bermuda Triangle one and I talked about theories then as well yeah. um, so if dinosaurs brains were too small to be adaptive then they wouldn't have flourished for 160 million years mm. um also plants do not have brains nor do they suffer from the same diseases as animals so their yep. simultaneous extinction makes these theories less plausible yeah um then for many years climate change was the most credible explanation um for the dinosaurs demise but dinosaurs thrived um they, they sort of thrived in the planet's consistently humid tropical climate but in the yeah. late mesozoic era evidence shows that the planet slowly became colder um lower temperatures caused ice to form over the north and south poles and mm -hmm. the oceans became colder um because the dinosaurs were cold-blooded meaning that they obtained body heat from the sun and the warm air they uh, there's a theory that they might not have been able to survive in significantly colder climates. Yeah. However, some species of cold-blooded animals, such as crocodiles, did survive. Um, so, yeah. yeah, and also climate change would have taken tens of thousands of years, giving the dinosaurs sufficient time to adapt and evolve to that. Um, Definitely. So that theory has been largely disregarded too. Um, so in 1956, um, a Russian astronomer again i've got another name that i need to try and pronounce i had it yesterday whether i've forgotten it in my sleep um joseph shklovsky shklovsky <laughs> that's a mouthful <laughs> shklovsky 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 yeah became the first scientist to consider that the extinction was due to a single catastrophic event and mm -hmm. he theorized that a supernova which is the explosion of a dying star uh, throwback ah. to episode 84 to learn yeah. more about stars i talk a lot about supernovas um showered the earth in radiation that could have killed the dinosaurs once again the problem with this theory was explaining why dinosaurs died out and other species didn't yeah um, also, a scientist said that such an event would have left evidence on the surface of the Earth. There would have been tiny amounts of radiation dating back to the Cretaceous period, but none was ever found. So enter uh, Luis Alvarez, who was a Nobel Prize winning physicist, inventor and pioneer in the field of radiation and nuclear research. He and his son, geologist Walter Alvarez, uh, were conducting research in Italy when they discovered a centimeter thick layer of iridium enriched clay in earth's okay. geology that dated back to the precise time the dinosaurs died um Ooh. iridium is rare on earth but is more common in space okay so the father and son duo published their findings in 1981 theorizing that the thin layer of iridium was um deposited following the impact of a large meteor uh, comet or asteroid um with the earth and mm -hmm. that this impact could have caused the extinction of the dinosaurs so at this time the alvarez theory was so far removed from prevailing 
hypotheses that it was ridiculed. Um, mm. Slowly, though, other scientists began finding iridium evidence at various places around the globe that mm -hmm. sort of corroborated the Alvarez theory. The problem was there was no obvious impact site to back this theory up. Right. However, in 1991, so 10 years later, a Whoa. massive a massive meteor crater, 110 miles in diameter, was discovered on the edge of the Yucatan Peninsula um, in Mexico, extending into the Gulf of Mexico. Wow. Um, scientists believe that the meteor that formed this crater would have been roughly six miles in diameter um, and struck the Earth at 40,000 miles per hour. Uh, releasing two million times more energy than the most powerful nuclear bomb ever detonated. And the heat would have boiled the Earth's surface, ignited mm -hmm. wildfires worldwide, and plunged the planet into darkness as debris <laughs> clouded the atmosphere. Uh, Miles-high tsunamis would have washed over the continents, drowning many forms of life, and shockwaves would have triggered earthquakes and vol volcanic eruptions. <laughs> all from this single meteor. Um, well, there you go. So we may think that the extinction of the dinosaurs was like one big massive explosion that wiped them all out in one fell swoop. Like that's how I've kind of always imagined it. Yeah. Um, but when that meteor impacted the Yucatan Peninsula, the result wasn't a huge fireball instantly incinerated all the dinosaurs. The process of extinction actually dragged on for hundreds, possibly thousands of years. Um, plunging global temperatures, uh, lack of sunlight, and the resulting lack of vegetation profoundly altered the food chain from the bottom up. So after the planet was plunged into darkness because of the debris in the atmosphere, um, the resulting freezing temperatures would have killed the plants, leaving, <laughs> leaving uh, the herbivores with nothing to eat, and mm -hmm. many dinosaurs would have died within weeks. Mm -hmm. um, the carnivores who feasted on the herbivores would have died a month or two later. Um, so overall, the huge loss of biodiversity would have been huge. Um, only small scavenging mammals that could burrow into the ground and eat whatever remained could have survived. The yeah. iridium layer plus the discovery of this impact crater were evidence enough to convince many scientists that finally the Alvarez theory was credible mm -hmm. and it explained much of what the previous theories couldn't. So even so... Agreement over dinosaur extinction is far from unanimous, even today. No. Um, fossils continue to be found that add to the body of knowledge about how, how dinosaurs lived and died. Mm -hmm. Only recently have birds been identified as descendants of the dinosaurs, and theories regarding dinosaur intelligence and behaviour continue to change. Even mm -hmm. long-established truths, such as dinosaurs' cold-bloodedness, are open for debate. Um, so the climate change theory still holds sway over some scientists um, who yeah. refute the idea that the meteor impact was the sole cause of the extinction. Mm -hmm. Evidence from uh, 65 million year old lava flows in India uh, hint that a giant uh, gaseous volcano, uh, volcanic plume uh, might have initiated global climate change uh, that mm -hmm. threatened the dinosaurs. Um, but new information about them is being constantly uncovered yeah so that's finally the end um <laughs> who knows what the future holds um oh maybe one God. day new discoveries could be made that change everything we thought we knew about the prehistoric past like that's the thing when it happened millions yeah. and millions we're talking like tens of millions of years ago maybe even hundreds of millions of years ago it's like it's so hard to it's not straightforward to figure out what happened and it's just crazy to think that one day a new theory could come about that will could completely change everything we thought we knew yeah well that's the beauty of it really I mean yeah. it how many times have we heard in the last few years that certain things we thought about dinosaurs is actually incorrect yeah like it wasn't that long ago that they even sort of turned around and went oh by the way there's a whole bunch of dinosaurs that we've always pictured as being scaly yeah actually had feathers yeah uh, yeah because of course they've only ever had to go on artistic interpretation based on the evidence that they could gather and then suddenly yeah. one day they gathered something and they were like oh no 
feathers were more prominent than yeah. what we originally thought were dinosaurs. And yeah. now they've got to redraw a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and it's add so feathers strange. to them. Yeah. Which oh, that, it's amazing. And of yeah. course, you know, one of the few things in our lifetime that we will the the, the fossils are the only evidence. Yeah. There's no pictures, there's no drawings. It's yeah we are literally going off of scientific theory yeah. until proved otherwise yeah. and it's fascinating and it's yeah. really cool yeah and there's a reason we love dinosaurs so much <laughs> yeah. yeah I just find it crazy thinking how different it could have been if that like for example say if the meteor didn't strike like if the meteor just sailed straight past her yeah like, <laughs> It's just mad thinking how different life could be now if the dinosaurs never were wiped out. Like, yeah, because humanity for a start may not be where it is nowadays yeah. if we had to contend with friggin' giant lizards. Yeah. <laughs> but then even seeing some of the animals, like you said, like the crocodiles yeah. and um, the, uh, the ones that are very clearly descendants of like yeah. prehistoric creatures like and when you like, look at animals wow. when you look at animals like rhinos and things like that i mean their name is literally not rhinoceros like it sounds yeah. like a dinosaur name and yeah. you look at um like triceratops and things like that where you see like these horned dinosaurs and then you look at things like rhinos and you just think they are dinosaurs like yeah. <laughs> And even like not even like thinking of dinosaurs and stuff. But if you think of like saber toothed tigers, yeah. And then what we've got now, and it's like you know, apart from evolutionary, the teeth have shortened. Yeah, they're not that far removed. I mean, yeah. elephants and mammoths. Yeah, like you can definitely see the link. Yeah, between the two, it's just you know, no hair yeah. because of course, why would they need it? It's not that cold anymore. Yeah. Evolution's Especially when they're when they're sort of like India and Africa based, mm -hmm. like, um, yeah, they. It's just it's crazy. I could I'd love to do talk more about evolution and things like that because it's it's such a giant topic. Like, there's it so is. much we could talk about. Like Darwinism on its own, yeah, would be fascinating there's, to talk yeah, about. There's so much we could talk about. Um, yeah. Adding so, to the lists, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, again, we always do this every episode stems like at least two or three more episode topics. Hell yeah. But when you talk like, about like prehistory, like how could you not come up with more episode topics when we're literally exactly. talking about like the past 200 million years of Earth's yeah. history? <laughs> it's like, a long time. I mean, you were talking about in, earlier on in the episode about how obviously with uh, Pangaea splitting yeah. um, and that's how you've been able to find fossils for mm -hmm. certain animals like all around the world. But then the opposite theory is true yeah. in the fact that certain groups of animals can only be found in yeah. certain places yeah. because Pangaea split and they all happen to be in that section. Yeah. Like Madagascar mm -hmm. and the Galapagos mm -hmm. are two fascinating examples of how there are only certain animals yeah. that can be found in those places they are nowhere else yeah. purely because they happen to all have congregated in that one area when Pangea yeah. split yeah it's crazy what the hell <laughs> yeah one episode I'd love to do as well it's been on my list for a little while um mm. if anyone's interested let me know is like uninhabited islands yeah um, so it relates to, again like things like the Galapagos um there's so many little islands out there that are fascinating but they're uninhabited by humans um yeah. and yeah i'd love to talk about some of those as well so that could be an episode that i'll cover at some point um yeah, yeah so many episodes that we can do this is why this <laughs> podcast has been running for almost 100 episodes and we probably have at least 100 more ideas <laughs> if that you know um, there's i think we've got more than that if we keep going yeah yeah beauty um, of this podcast we can talk about anything yeah <laughs> Yeah, excited to get to episode 500. <laughs> um, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, it's it's weird talking about mass extinction, but it's kind of interesting more than devastating because it happened so long ago. Um, yeah. It is kind of interesting and terrifying thinking about the fact that we, as I said earlier, the, the idea that we could potentially be living through the sixth mass extinction event, which is... But in a weird yeah. way, it's also comforting at the same time because each of these mass extinctions happened 
over the course of a series of hundreds of thousands of years possibly even millions possibly even millions so the yeah. fact that that's been the case for previous ones and if we are in the middle of one mm -hmm. kind of comforted to know that it doesn't mean we're going to all be wiped out tomorrow yeah <laughs> wait if you see what it, i mean it could be in a million years yeah and you know it's very sort of like oh it doesn't affect me yeah. but you know yeah oddly comforting but also yeah. at the same time we really should do something about yeah. it yeah yeah it's yeah still scary um yeah. so yeah a nice note to end on uh, <laughs> we're all going to die <laughs> we're all going to die <laughs> um yeah so if you enjoyed this please let us know um i as i said earlier i'd love to try and get melinda salisbury on to yes. to talk about dinosaurs Give her a shout. or she's just released a new book as well that is um like a sort of almanac like a nature sort of Ooh. um that and that's really cool um so anything to do with like nature or that would be really cool to get her on. I'll, I'll add her to our list. Um, yep. Yeah, if, if you like this and you're interested in similar topics, then please let us know. Um, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at LearnAboutPod. Um, our website is LearnAboutPod.com where you can find the notes and all the links and resources for this episode. There's tons more information that I could have covered. Um, obviously, I'll be here all day otherwise. Um, you can find our index on the website as well um, where you can find a lot of similar topics um and you can also support us if you like on patreon it's patreon.com slash learn about pod for two pounds a month you can get early episodes uh, bonus episodes twice a month um exclusive sort of video series like our tangent tuesdays where we give you recommendations and we just chat about our podcast stats and just kind of let you in on on behind the scenes of the podcast um we'll send you a postcard um a bunch of stuff it'll be really yeah. cool if you want to go and support us over there, uh, again, patreon.com slash learnaboutpod. Um, yeah, thank you so much to our current patrons. We'll give you a shout out at the end. Um, yeah. I think that was super smooth. Smooth. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting, getting the hang of this, just like it took us ages to get the hang of our tagline at the beginning yeah. and figure out what that actually was going to be. When <laughs> I think we're finally now being able to smoothly do our our pl all the plugs at the end of the episode as well <laughs> <laughs> nearly 100 episodes in and we are getting there we yeah. are getting there <laughs> um very exciting update is that next week will be the start of our christmas episodes we yeah. have three episodes for you this year three christmas ones yeah. just as of how the dates have panned out we have a guest episode next week which is very cool um it's a bit of a mystery episode um mm. If you, again, if you support us on Patreon, Flinos, um, who is going to be our guest, was actually uh, in our Tangent Tuesday um, she th was. this week. And she kind of gave a little bit of a hint about what that episode is going to be. So if you want to head mm -hmm. over there and and kind of listen to that, then you can get um, an insight into what that is going to be. But yeah, we have three Christmas episodes coming for you over the next three mm -hmm. weeks. Um, and then we have our massive... Uh, um what's the word milestone coming up <gasps> of 100 episodes which is just <sighs> oh very exciting um very exciting so yes until next week um we'll see you for the first of our festive episodes um and i hope you have a great week see you then bye see you then. bye, bye.